okay so today uh, we are presenting about the management of renal trauma for the ehu guidelines okay yeah. sorry where is everybody else just 60 people sorry you can hear me huh? it's okay yeah yeah okay i'm hearing you okay okay so let yeah clear clear so uh, uh so introduction i just want to inform that normally renal trauma accounts to one to five percent of all trauma admissions most commonly is trauma renal trauma is seen in males whether they are young males like especially because most of them are not really they don't really stay at home, out, climbing, taking motorbikes, getting into accidents, falling down, out, getting into fights. So, overall population incidence is 4.9 or 100,000 people. And normally, in real trauma, we can either put it as a blunt trauma or a penetrating trauma. Most of the time, blunt is more common compared to penetrating. It's nine times more common. Most injuries, renal injuries, are managed non operatively. Next, I'll just briefly mention regarding the blunt trauma. Blunt injuries normally is caused from uh, motor vehicle accidents, falls, sporting injuries, and also assaults. So, in this way, normally the kidney or the hyaline structures are directly crushed. Less commonly, there is some sudden deceleration which can result from the vascular fracture and also the EG. Then the penetrating injuries are normally from stab wounds and gunshot wounds. Okay, they are actually more severe and uh, less predictable than a blood trauma. The cause is the causes only a direct tissue dysfunction or the parenchyma, vascular pedicles, or the collective system. This can also be associated to multiple other organ injuries. Now, I'll briefly describe regarding the anatomy of the kidney. Okay, the kidney is a B-shaped organ, which is located at retro peritoneally. It is actually a size of at least three vertebra length. You can see the bipolar length normally is from nine to twenty centimeters. The position of the kidney. Bilaterally, the uh, left side is usually slightly higher compared to the right because of the position of the people. Normally, the location is from T12 to L3. The kidney is relatively a well protected uh, organ because of the anatomical location, like I mentioned, and it has got a lot of cowries, including the uh, we know capsule is a tough fibrous capsule followed by perivenal fat and we know uh, the gerota fascia and also pararenal fat. Okay. Children are actually more susceptible to renal injury compared to adults and the reason being is because they have uh, proportionally the kidney size is proportionally greater in size compared to the rest of their body because they are so small. There is less perirenal fat. The abdominal musculature is actually a lot weaker. And the, mus the, uh, the bone has less fortified in the thoracic cage. And some of them may have uh, congenital anomalies which increases the risk of injury. If renal injury is normally classified using the AAFP, Classification. Okay, what does AAST stand for? It's the American Association of Surgery and Trauma. Okay, this actually validates the morbidity and also the need for any intervention. Okay, in this slide you can see there is five grading for renal injury. Grade one is normally just a non expanding subcapsular hematoma without any and chimal laceration. The condition normally you can either see some microscopic or gross hematuria. And for grade 2, there will be a non-expanding carry renal hematoma confined to retroperitoneum. 
or a laceration of less than 1 cm superficial uh, cortical laceration yeah? but it does not involve the connective system grade 3 is a more than 1 cm deep laceration which also does not involve the connective system grade 4 renal injury is where the laceration is extending up to the medulla or the connective system there is also the renal artery or vein injury with contained hemorrhage Grade 5 is only a shattered kidney, a totally devascularized kidney with no blood flow. Okay, from this picture you can see the bleeding. I move to the next one. Okay, this is more of a radiological picture that you can see. Okay, this one is a lot clearer. You can see based on the arrow over here that picture A, yeah? you can see a uh, subventricular hematoma here, which is small and there's no uh, laceration seen. Okay. E, it is supposed to be a grade 2, the laceration away can be seen from the arrow here, pointing here, is less than 1 cm. Grade 3 is, you can see some hematoma collection outside here, with the laceration extending more than 1 cm. Grade 4, this uh, picture number D, it's a grade 4 injury where there's a artery, a version of lobular artery. Okay, it's not involving, it's not a main artery, over here it's just a lobular artery that's causing uh, ischemic section of the kidney. Grade, I mean, sorry, picture E is a grade 5 renal injury where you can see the entire kidney is devascularized. Okay, over here you can see grade 5, this is a shattered kidney. The total uh, structure of the kidney cannot be identified completely. Okay. Another thing I want to show about grade 4 renal injury here, you can see there's a contrast extravasation uh, surrounding the kidney. This is urine extravasation. Okay. So it forms like a urinoma around the kidney. Initial management normally is a standard ATLS protocol where we do our normal primary survey and followed by a secondary survey. So primary survey will normally include your ABCDE, is your airway maintenance with cervical spine protection, breathing and ventilation, and to uh, circulation with hemorrhage control, and there's disability assessment where you assess the level of consciousness. You can assess based on GCS or they have an ABDU whether patients are alert respond to verbal stimuli, respond to behavior or unresponsive. You also check for the pupils. Exposure and environmental meaning you have to first expose patient completely, meaning uh, you have to remove all the clothes. Another thing, environment, make sure patient does not develop microphobia. Resuscitation is usually done together with the primary survey. When you protect the airway, secure airway or protect the cervical spine, the breathing must be Ensure check for your trachea positioning, look out for any tension pneumothorax, massive pneumothorax, or any open pneumothorax. Then with reverse shock therapy, you must need to have two large ball granulas uh, at least. Then crystalloid solution, you get the blood grouping done, and if required anti urgent surgical intervention, you should consider it. You will again once again protect patients from hypothermia. Okay, catheterization can be done. If there is no indication, either RAS tube or urinary catheterization. Secondary survey normally involves a uh, more thorough uh, history taking. You need to do a complete neurological examination and need to do clinical assessment. Uh, check all orifices if the DRE is indicated to be done. The patient has to be re evaluated based on all the vital signs and uh, patient parameters. Okay. Renal injury we usually present when the Primary survey as a hypovolemic shock. However, most of the time is identified in the secondary survey after an EMG has been done. Normally, physical examination will have a flank bruising, stab wounds. This is what you have to look out for. Any flank bruising, stab wounds, bullet entry or exit wounds, abdominal tenderness, flank pain, fractured lower ribs, and also flank abrasion.
trauma normally that happens to the anterior at the anterior and secondary line will cause more uh, prone damage to the renal hilum or the ventricle compared to the posterior axillary line which will normally have trauma to the parenchymal vein. As you can see through this picture, you can see that why anterior axillary line corresponds directly to the hilum, so injury to this side will cause the disruption of the hilum. Posteriorly is the kidney, renal parenchyma, so injury will move towards the renal parenchyma. Lab investigations can be done, <coughs> the urine analysis, look for hematocrit and baseline creatinine are actually required. Hematuria is actually the key finding for renal injury. However, if a major injury, such a disruption of the DUA, medical injury, or segmental artery thrombosis, <coughs> and stem wound may not necessarily have hematuria. Hematuria that is out of proportion to the history of trauma may suggest pre existing pathology. So, if at all the uh, mechanism of uh, injury does not really cause the patient's having hematuria, can be due to other causes, should we talk about other causes such as stone or any other pre-existing condition. Okay, goals of imaging will be to grade the renal injury, to document any pre-existing pathology of the kidney, any presence, I mean for, look out for the presence of the contralateral kidney to see if it's normal, and identify other injuries, uh, other or other organ injuries. Indication for renal imaging. Normally, we look out for visible hematuria. This will warrant for uh, CT imaging, uh, renal CT. Non visible hematuria or with one episode of hypotension will also warrant for uh, renal imaging. Okay, just uh, microscopic hematuria alone with patient being stable does not indicate, I mean, does not really need to proceed for a CT scan. Then any history based on the history of injury, the mechanism of injury, we have to see if there's any rapid deceleration injury, then you should proceed for CT scan. Penetrating traumas must look for CT, must proceed for CT scan too. In pediatric age group, whether there is a hematuria, gross hematuria, or microscopic hematuria, a CT scan must be done. Okay, for pediatric age group, yeah. Then look up any clinical signs like I mentioned before the physical examination, like any flank pain, abrasion, fractured lower limb, and abdominal distension should proceed for the CT scan. Uh, CT is the imaging modality that we use in stable patients. Ideally, performed in three phases there's an arterial phase, nephropathic phase, and also delayed phase. Arterial phase normally you look out for any vascular injury, plenty uh, presence of any active extravasation of contrast from the blood vessel. In epigenic phase, normally demonstrate any parenchyma contribution, laceration. In the delayed phase, you want to identify the collecting system, see if there's any leakage of urine from the collecting system. Okay, so, if let's say in general practice, sometimes we cannot do this three phase study. So, when you proceed the CT abdomen, you can always add in a delayed phase. Once again, I'm going to show you the grade 1 renal injury. This is 2, usually I'm showing a perirenal hematoma. A grade 3 injury. This you can see, there's a vascular injury over here, causing a ischemic uh, portion. This one shows contrast extravasation from the collecting system, which should be a grade 4. This is a shattered kidney, a completely shattered kidney. You do not get a normal structure of a kidney anymore. Here's more examples. Another thing that can be done is actually an intravenous pyrogram. The elastic patient has gone into OT and without a CT scan being done. A one-shot intraoperative uh, intravenous pyelography can be done to check for the presence of functioning contralateral kidney. Okay, normally, we inject a bolar intravenous injection of a radiographic contrast of 2 mL per kilo, uh, then followed by a single plain film taken after 10 minutes.
Okay, normally management for renal you know, injury is we go for non-operative management. Okay, non-operative management basically we say is a package of care. It's a stepwise starting with conservative treatment followed by minimally invasive and if necessary, we proceed for surgical intervention. Normally, this package of care actually varies from different, different centers. Like in our center, we have intervention radiology, so we can consider angio embolization which will be in two weeks. Okay, management of trauma based on the time injuries and blunt renal disease in stable patient, period of bed rest, a serial blood test, regular observation, and be with pain if it's indicated. Tsunami grade 1 to 3 injuries can be managed non operatively. Grade 4 injuries are most treated conservatively, but there's always a requirement of subsequent intervention. So, this grade 4 renal you know, injury may require a EEG. Persistent any urinary extravasation from an otherwise viable kidney after blunt trauma often responds to a placement of stent or proteus drainage. In sense, if there's a grade 4 renal you know, injury and patient has got a uh, disruption over the PUJ, then we will have to place a stand. We will have to place a stand or percutaneous drainage of the urethroma, both to, or we put both together. For grade five uh, renal injury, <coughs> present with patient with a hemodynamic instability, and also have other major associated. So there's a higher rate of exploration and entrectomy in this patient. Okay, if there's a unilateral knee arterial injury or arterial thrombosis, normally can be managed non-operatively also if patient is hemodynamically stable. There's surgical repairs reserved for bilateral arterial injuries, or injuries involving a solitary functional factors which increase risk for intervention. Normally, this hematoma. A size more than 12 cm is a penetrating trauma, vascular contrast extravasation, para renal hematoma extension, concomitant injuries of patient in trauma. This, in case of uh, just want to show, there's a renal artery thrombosis following a deceleration injury that normally happens due to intima breakage in the vascular artery in the vessel. Okay, we can see based on the CT scan over here, the kidney has gone ischemic. Okay, it is due to thrombosis, but you do not see any hematoma, any bleeding outside. So in this sense, you do not need to proceed, uh, can be managed conservatively. But in, in situations, which uh, normally, I mean, it's not common, but let's just say if the patient was able to be diagnosed early within four hours, a stand can be placed. Okay, penetrating renal injuries, the site of wound is important, hemodynamic stability, and diagnosing are the main determinants whether to proceed for intervention or not. Any low grade stab wounds over the posterior to the anterior intervention can be managed non operatively in stable patients. Grade 3 or higher injuries managed externally but warrant close observation and the clinical cause is more unpredictable because it is more unpredictable and associated with higher rate of delayed intervention. Okay, if there's a high grade injury, patient will need a surgical intervention. Okay. Selective angioembolization is important for renal trauma. It is the key role for non-operative management. Normally accepted CT findings indicating the need for angioembolization is extra uh, active extravasation of contrast. And it leads to uh, fistula and pseudo aneurysm. Most of this uh, angioembolization is actually most beneficial in the setting of high grade renal trauma, at least AAST more than 3. So you can see successful in uh, angioembolization is successful in up to 94.9% of grade 3, 89% of grade 4, 52% of grade 5 injury. Okay, repeat angioembolization actually prevents nephrectomy in 67%. Follow up for patients with renal trauma. I mean, they come for follow up, you want to do a physical examination. 
check primary urine analysis to see primary hematuria through present. Diagnostic imaging can be done, such as uh, ultrasound. They will see if there's any uh, collection or any increase in urinoma or anything. Blood pressure management is important, and you also have to check for serum craving. Early uh, complications is less than a month can be bleeding, infection, perinephric abscess. A patient can develop sepsis from there. Any urinary fistula formation, hypertension, urinary extravasation, or even urinoma. I see. Um, okay, that's delayed. Okay, which is more than a month will be bleeding. Any hydronephrosis present? Need any absorption? Stone formation, chronic pyelonephritis, hypertension, and AVF. I think I've repeated hydronephrosis two times. And pseudo aneurysm. Why? I mean, I just realized that I've been mentioning regarding hypertension in uh, the early and also late complications. This is normally due to hematoma formation, which actually forms a scarring towards the tissue or even thrombosis to the renal artery. We actually call this to be page. Okay, that is all for my presentation. Hope I didn't bore everybody out. Uh, hello, uh, Naresh. Hey, yeah, boss. Okay, uh, actually a very good uh, presentation. Um, uh, you cover most of the important topic. Then, uh, Naresh, uh, can you uh, could you uh, share with us uh, uh, when the patient in the ward, uh, do you okay. repeat any scan or, or not? If you repeat, uh, what is the reason? Uh, what factor you affect you to make that kind of a decision? Yeah. Okay, if the patient, okay, let's say we are having the patient now, what we have admitted and we are observing the patient. Number one, uh, we will actually monitor the hematopoietin, I mean, uh, hemoglobin level for the patient. And if you have a CBD, we will also look up for any persistent hematuria. So in these kind of cases, the patient, if at all, uh, the patient is not stable, or requiring multiple blood transfusions and persistent hematuria, we will want to have a repeat imaging for the patient. And also another thing, if patients are grade four, you know, injury with the disruption of the EEJ, uh, where there is urinoma collection, we will also want to repeat another scan to see whether there's an increase in the urinoma that is collecting around the kidney. Well, um, usually we repeat the. Uh, uh, we will repeat the scan uh, if uh, grade 3 and above um, the injury. So from the initial grading, if a grade 3 and above, we will routinely repeat the scan uh, during 40, 40 hours to 72 hours. Uh, mainly we don't want to look at uh, any secondary hemorrhage or uh, urinoma formation. Uh, this is the two reason. Okay. 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 That's all. I think thank you. Uh, thank you, Bossy.